Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Turn the Page podcast. This is Jessica, and I have an author today who wrote a book that uh, I was scrolling through book Twitter, and I saw the cover, and I saw the title, and I was like, sign me up. I don't need to read (laughs) the plot just yet, and then I did, and I wanted to read it even more, and then I read the book, and it was even better. I am going to allow him to introduce himself and tell us about the book that we will be talking about today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Rob Hart, uh, and the book is The Paradox Hotel, which is, you know, I like to joke that it's like, it's my take on a time travel story, but with robots and dinosaurs, um, because I'm going to write time travel, I really got to, you know, have fun with it. But really, it's it's about a uh, it's about a hotel for time travelers, you know, where people stay before they take off for their, their trips. And uh, there's the, this house detective, January, who's like a former time agent. And, you know, she, um, she finds a dead body, but only she can see it. So she's basically trying to solve this weird, impossible crime at the same time that the, the government is in the process of privatizing time travel. Like they're about to sell it off to the highest bidder, which, you know, if you read the news at all, you know, privatization is usually pretty bad. So, um, so yeah, and then it just turns into a big two day nightmare, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun to write. And you know, I'm I'm just now like it's February first as we're we're recording this, it's just now starting to kick into gear, and it is so exciting to finally get to this point of like, hey, now I get to talk to people about the book. It was really fun to read too, and as you were saying, uh, you know, the idea of the government privatizing uh, things. Um, is an evergreen topic and it obviously seemed like something that could conceivably happen if um, time travel for travel was a thing and if something like the Paradox Hotel existed, especially, you know, in the days of billionaires flying spaceships because they could afford to do it. And um, I was trying to think, I just saw that movie, Don't Look Up, where uh, I have yeah. not seen that yet, but but it seems like it's in my wheelhouse. Yeah, it is because um, I was actually reading this book around the same time I watched that movie. And while they're very different, just sort of the idea of the government being like, "Oh yeah, you know this thing, we can make money off of this. This is this is a great idea," and it really not being a great idea. Uh, you know, it was yep. it was a fun time to be reading this book at the same time as watching that. But uh, one thing I really loved about this book was, first of all, I mean, there were dinosaurs in it, as you mentioned, and um, it, you seem to be having a lot of fun with that. Um, it was it was almost like um, a microcosm of Jurassic Park, but in sort of like a very fun, self-aware way. Yeah, it was. Oh, man, like that. And that's actually that's really funny, too, because when I when I first pitched this book to my agent. Uh, he told me not to write it because I also and I did a bad job pitching it. I did a really bad job explaining it, and uh, and and the dinosaurs were a part of it. And he's like, "Dude, come on, man, you can't do this." Like after Warehouse, don't do this to me because like Warehouse was like a big like quote unquote issues book, and it was about you know the evils of capitalism and and all this stuff. And and this was definitely a little bit more off the wall. And finally, I kind of like stamped my feet and I cried and I told him, "No, this is the book I want to write, uh, and I'm going to have my dinosaurs." And he read the book and he was like, Oh my God, like you actually pulled it off. And, uh, and when when it got a, it got a star review from publishers weekly and his response was pretty much like, I cannot believe you come to me with a book with dinosaurs in it. And I'm like, Hey man, you got to trust me. And, um, so I I think what I'm going to do now is propose something even more ridiculous for my next book. And then use this as like my bargaining chip. Be like, man, I was right about the dinosaurs. I'm right about, you know, whatever stupid thing I think of next. I can't wait to hear what it is. I can't wait to figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the characters, so January is uh, the main protagonist of the book and she's got a lot of baggage, which yes. is awesome because she works in a hotel and there's a lot of baggage 
in this hotel as well, um, yeah. not just regarding the, the travelers. Uh, but one thing I thought was really interesting, and I don't want to give too much of it away, is it, the idea of it being slightly a ghost story, but with the idea of time slips being yeah. the reason for the ghost story. That's sort of a, um, I guess it's, it's sort of an urban legend, the idea of a time slip that you walk into a place and suddenly you're in another time and place witnessing something from the past and then suddenly you're back. Uh, and I always thought that those those um, stories were very interesting. And I liked the way it fit into this particular novel in the sense that because this hotel exists where it exists, there is things that happen both to the people who stay there and the people who work there for any amount of time that uh, make the hotel in a sense haunted, even if it's not really haunted. Yeah, I, I loved the idea of playing with that, of like, you know, because I remember reading that like a long time ago, um, and not, not that I read into it very, very deeply, but this idea that like, you know, people who see ghosts, it's actually like, you know, sort of like a, sort of like a weird like stutter in the time stream or something that you're not so much seeing a ghost in the present moment as you're just seeing a past moment or something. And, you know, the, the, there just seemed to be so many fun ideas to play with there. And that was the real challenge of taking on a time travel story because I've always wanted to do one. I've always really loved time travel stuff. But when you do that, you know, uh, I, I think there's a responsibility on the author to then make it your own. You know, you have to figure out a way to kind of like make it really unique and interesting and different. And yeah, just kind of like playing into these different ideas that I've had over the years kind of helped me do that and put together something that I hope uh, felt a little bit new and fresh for a genre that's been, you know, done over and over again. Yeah, it really did. It was a lot of fun to read and sort of a lot of fun to figure out where it was going because it really, um, I think around the 75% point I thought I did and then it switched again and that was just so much like so, such a fun ride. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, so um, one of the things that we find out about January is that she is what is called unstuck. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, it was this idea of, you know, treating time as sort of like a radiation thing. Like that was my concept of like, you know, the more, and it's sort of like the way that, you know, pilots and, and um, uh, people who work in like the service industry on planes, they are exposed to actually more radiation than most people because they spend a lot of time in the upper atmosphere where there's more, you know, radi radiation hitting the plane. And overall, it's not really like a super dangerous thing. But I kind of liked this idea of someone who spent a lot of time in the time stream sort of having this like overexposure and how for some people it can kind of mess with their, their cognitive ability in terms of how they perceive linear time. Uh, because that was the other thing is like, I thought it would be kind of cool to do a time travel story where there was no actual time travel in the sense that no one gets in a machine and hits a button and goes to a specific point in the past. You know, yeah, it, was it was more of a perception was, thing than a physical thing. Yeah, it was really more about the hotel itself, like all the time, the, the quote unquote time travel was happening off screen in the traditional sense, uh, but this was more like the time travel was overlapping into the hotel and people who worked there because of their connection. Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, and I liked this idea of like her being like really, really good at her job and because she was so dedicated, she kind of suffered for it. But even through that suffering, she kind of became better at her job because she's a detective who can suddenly see things like before they happen. I mean, how great would that be? Um, so, it, it, and, and once I kind of zeroed in on that, it was just so fun to play with that mechanic of like something might happen and she has to kind of figure it out before it does. But even, even still, she's seeing it in such a limited capacity that she still has to figure out the context around it. She still doesn't know the timing. So there's still that question of when is this going to happen? You know, it was just, it was so much fun stuff to, to, to sink my teeth into. And, and then I started writing it and it was like, oh my God, what have I done? 
Um, because time travel sounds like a really fun thing to do. And then you start writing it and you're like, why, why did I do this to myself? Yeah, I could see that it's extremely messy. And one of the things that was really interesting again, was just because she has this condition, even though she was really, really good at her job. And also she's a really difficult person to get along with. That's the other thing. Uh, she's not yeah. um, the most congenial person, uh, especially ha working in the hospitality industry alongside pros who are used to the hospitality and she's got her own situation. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting was that because of her condition, people automatically thought that she was an unreliable narrator, but she herself was not exactly 100% sure she could trust what she was perceiving. Yeah, it's it's so much fun playing with unreliable narrators. You know, it's like, I, I just, it, it was, it's so fun to play with this idea of like, because it's sort of, I don't know, I guess like, and I don't mean this in like a, a negative way, but like, I think there is a degree to which authors have to kind of manipulate the reader. Um, you know, we have to kind of get you believe in one thing so that we can like, you know, surprise you with something else. And so it, it's this fun process of like learning how to kind of portray things in a certain way so that we can lead you down a certain road and then all of a sudden like push you off into a different direction. And um, so, and, and I think unreliable narrators are actually a really, really easy way to do that because, you know, you, you, you have to, if, if you can strike this balance between building trust so that you know that January is good at her job, that she, you know, is a capable person and, you know, you can kind of trust her to get the job done in the end, then you can really sort of have some fun with that. And like I said, like, I like that it wasn't even that she was a traditional unreliable narrator. It was, she herself wasn't even sure. Because, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's seeing this body that she keeps calling Schrodinger's body. She's like, it shouldn't be here. This this room right now, this should not be here. And it, it wasn't even like you're like, I don't think I trust her 100%. I don't I don't think she's telling us everything. Even if she could, she wasn't 100% sure that she really understood that what was going on whether that was like really what was happening and I loved that about it and I loved just the whole time travel aspect of it uh one thing I also loved about this book was there was this really nice sense of found family um you find out uh January one of the reasons she has so much baggage is because she lost her girlfriend her soulmate the love of her life Nina uh, and it's all tied to the hotel. And maybe this is a reason why she herself feels very tied to it. But there's also all these other people who work in the hotel who she may or may not realize care about her, even though she's a jerk. <laughs> and um, found family stories, I think, make so much sense to people, especially in in these times when it feels like everything is so divided. It feels like going to Thanksgiving dinner with your family is like dangerous, you know, having like your friends and having uh, a, a family without blood that you can take comfort in um, adds so much to every story. And I loved how it played in here. I really, I, I've always loved uh, stories about found family, you know, um, and, and, and look, like I get along with my family great, but I also, I love my friends. I love the community of people that I've, I've surrounded myself with. And, and there's, there's something really special about that. Cause the thing about friends is that you get to choose them, you know, so you get to be a little bit more discerning. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it's something that runs through a lot of my writing. I, it runs through, I mean, a lot of people's writing is, is this sense of like community and collective action and, and sort of like the importance of, of doing things together and being there for each other. And, um, you know, uh, I, I've always been sort of attracted to these stories where you kind of have to like browbeat someone into understanding that, you know, uh, because that's something that, that I certainly had a difficult time understanding for a little while. But January is someone who, uh, you know, she has a lot to offer and she's a very kind and loving person, but she just doesn't really realize that for herself yet. Everyone else kind of sees it. That's why they still kind of tolerate a lot of her, her rudeness and, and her bad behavior. 
um, because they see her potential. Um, she's the only one who doesn't see her potential. And so uh, really, I, I mean, if I were to boil the book down to a singular theme, I would say it's just like about how difficult it is to face yourself, you know? And sometimes you need to look toward other people for help in that. So the different uh, wings of the hotel were named after different science fiction or speculative fiction authors or scientists? Yeah, yeah. That was, it was cool. uh You know, I, I realized this because uh, I was just putting together notes. Um, so my last book, The Warehouse, I was putting together notes that will go on Goodreads and appear in Kindles, which is kind of a cool thing. And um, there's a Margaret Atwood reference in, in The Warehouse. Now there's a Margaret Atwood reference in... Um, in this one, and I'm kind of hoping one day she just notices, I'm just going to keep on putting Margaret Atwood references in all of my books until finally, like, she's like, hey, stop writing about, me. leave me alone. Um, but yeah, and then and then the other wing is the butler wing for Octavia Butler, um, because, you know, Kindred was obviously, you know, in terms of time travel stories, that that's that's near the top. And um, yeah, the uh, and then for 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 the ballroom, it was Ada Lovelace, I, the, the Lovelace ballroom for for the scientist. And, and I just thought, like, because it was kind of this fun idea that I was playing with of like, you know, in this reality, like time travel is invented by a woman and yet they still name the time for it after Albert Einstein, which seems like such a, yes, this is exactly what yes. the US government would do in this situation. <laughs> right. It's like this woman does this, but let's, let's name it after the famous old white guy who died a hundred years ago or, or whatever. Kind of, kind of like, I mean, not in the same sense, but in, in that sense that um, when, when people talk about Hedy Lamar or had in the past it's like oh she was a really beautiful actress and then you're just like oh she was also a scientist and a lot of yeah. her research uh is stuff that we use all the time but you know yeah, yeah she was she was gorgeous but you know like how about uh how about bringing you know how about talking about that um yeah that was that was pretty cool actually uh and I hadn't thought about that for some reason until you just said it and I'm just like oh right <laughs> um so yeah that was that's uh, uh was a lot of was a lot of fun um so as far as the time travel rules because there's always rules to time travel uh there's there's a lot of talk about like what you're supposed to do and what you aren't supposed to do did you take all of that very seriously like if people were time traveling you know, they, they're not supposed to touch anything. They could just be tourists. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know, I, and that was another thing that was kind of like a tough uh, line to walk because on one hand, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create, I'm trying to play with this idea of like ripple effects where like if you do something really significant in the past, it could affect the future. Um, but I think even within that, you have to acknowledge that like, you know, if, if, if I go to like, 18th century London and just stand on a street corner for 10 minutes, I've still changed something because I wasn't there previously, you know, like even, even if I do nothing, say nothing, talk to nobody, eat not, like nothing, I've still created some kind of minor change. So it was trying to sort of, and, and you find yourself in the weeds on this stuff where you're trying to sort of convey that without bogging down the reader and like really obnoxious rules and stuff. Um, so it was, yeah, yeah, that, that was the challenge of doing it was this idea. So, so, so I also, I tried to create limits for myself. Like, for example, there was no, you, we, they only figured out how to go to the past. They haven't figured out how to go to the future. And, and that sort of, once I decided on that, like my job got a lot easier. It was like figuring it, like, I actually think rules like limiting yourself kind of makes your life a little bit easier sometimes because then you're, you, you do less spinning out trying to figure out all these different scenarios. And um, yeah. Yeah, I felt like I felt pretty good about it uh, until I gave it to my editor. And then he just like completely like <laughs> the guy's brilliant. Like he did like The Martian. He did Ready Player One. He does all these big books. Um, he's such a smart guy. And he really he, he pointed out like all these inconsistencies. And I'm like, oh, I guess I still have a lot of work to do. Um, but I think it's OK. I mean, I, I'm sure that like I'm sure I'm going to end up with like like someone's going to be like you messed up this or you, you, you what, what about this what about this this paradox or this inconsistency and you know it'll be fine Everything's I think so too I think this was a really good book and uh, I was really excited to read it and I'm glad that I'm glad that I'm able to talk to you about it uh, so I have another question and this is just yeah. in general do you have a favorite time travel story 
It could be television, books, movies, podcasts. Ooh, okay. That's interesting. Um, I really, uh, yeah, God, because I read so many. Um, <laughs> I want to say Time Cop because that's the dumb answer. Like, but Time Cop's actually a pretty awesome movie. Um, that's okay. My, I, my, I, dumb, my dumb answer would be anytime they do time travel in Futurama. Yeah, no, that's always a good thing. Um, I feel like one one of the ones that I kept on going back to that I just really, really remember viscerally enjoying was like the fourth season of Lost. When that suddenly turned into a time travel show, I was like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. And um, I, I think that's like probably around, like, because I've always liked those kinds of stories, but I, I kind of feel like that's when the seed was kind of planted for me. Like, ooh, like I should do this. Um, and then uh, for, from recent memory, like I, I love that, like that's where the, the last Avengers movie went. Like that was just an absolute ton of fun. And it was like, it was funny because I was in the process of writing Paradox Hotel when I saw that movie and I was like, hey, this is fun. This now counts as research. So how long did it take you to write this? You know, that's a good question. I, my, my process is always kind of weird in the sense that like I had the idea that I sat there for a few months and then I finally committed to it. And I did like tons and tons of research, uh, a lot of outlining. I, I literally drew a map of what the hotel would look like because I really need that. I'm, I'm a visual thinker. Like I had all the rooms marked off. I had the entire, like the entire, it's pretty. Is it, there it, a it, deluxe it's, it's edition crazy. of this coming out that has the map? But see, I would need to give it to an artist who can actually translate it into something understandable because it's one of those things that I look at it and I totally understand and someone else would look at it and go, hey, maybe this guy's a serial killer because um, it, it's complete lunacy. But it, it worked for me and that's all that really matters. Um, but I would say like beginning to end, like for my part of the process had to be like maybe six or seven months and then handing it over to my, my editor, like my agent and, and some friends. And then finally my editor added like maybe another like six or so months to it. Um, but I, I, I feel like I'm an outlier in the sense that I walk, I work fast, um, because I, I used to be a journalist, so I'm really good at hitting deadlines. And I also like, because I do so much research and outlining and stuff, um, I tend to, once I sit down to go, I pretty much have the whole thing in my head. It's just a matter of getting it out at that point. So one more thing. Uh, so the poem Jabberwocky comes up a few times in this story. Yeah. It is yeah. such a good poem. It's such a good poem. And I'm a little out of practice. I don't remember the whole thing, but there was a period where I knew the entire poem word for word. And that's because um, I used to read it to my daughter a lot. Oh, nice. uh, when she was really young, we we had a little Jabberwocky, uh, one of those board books, and um, oh, I and think yeah, I, I read the, it. I think I had the same one because I used Probably, to read yeah. it to my kids too. Yeah. yeah, 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 and um, and she loved it, and I read it to her almost every day to the point where I had kind of committed it to memory, and then um, when I kind of decided like, okay, I'm going to throw some like through the looking grass glass references into this book because why not? Um, because it felt thematically appropriate. Uh, I, I was like, oh, well, I got to do this. And, and it's fun for me because it's like a little nod to my daughter, um, even though she's not my biggest fan, unfortunately. She says my books uh, do not have their, their, their books for their boring books for grownups that kids don't like because they don't have pictures. Um, oh. Which is fine. She's seven. I'm going to give her a little bit of slack on that one. Um, but yeah, it, it was really fun to put that in there and then to, to feel like, OK, this actually kind of works. It did work. And uh, one thing I was curious about, you know, like Alice in Wonderland isn't really sci-fi, but it seems to get a lot of um, sci-fi adjacent love and uh, fans. There's, there's so much like craziness in those stories and the poems are so surreal. Uh, do you have another Lewis Carroll poem that you really enjoy? Not really. No, uh, I'm not deeply read on Lewis Carroll. I mean, I ah. did read through the looking glass since I was going to, and, and I, I'm very familiar with Alice in Wonderland, obviously, like outside of having a child. Um, but yeah, it was sort of, the, the, there's something about Lewis Carroll stuff that's just so weird and off the wall, but also so sort of like deeply engaging. And um, so the idea, especially like, and again, like don't really want to reveal too much about the book, but I, I right. think like, once you read the book, you understand why Through the Looking Glass is like a fairly good reference for that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's just like, 
it, it's also fun to kind of like reach back into those like old pieces of literature and sort of like dust them off a little bit and say, hey, you know, this is still relevant, it's still cool. And I can find a way to play with this. Yeah, it was funny because Paradox Hotel, what year about does it take place in? I think it was 2072. I think that's what I settled on for like literally no discernible reason. I just kind of like picked a target in my head. It see the reason I say that is because it seems like, you know, as things that stick around, it seems like that would be something that would stick around and still be relevant or still be uh, something oh, yeah. that people would be reciting, even though it's much older than it is now. I mean, I know people who are familiar with the poem and are surprisingly not sure what it's from originally. So. Uh, yeah, and, and that's that's why I thought the poem was kind of perfect for the book, because it's one of those things that like some people are going to read it and say, oh, that's Jabberwocky. And some people are going to read it and go, what is this hot nonsense? You know, or they're going to be kind of familiar. They're going to know like it kind of it's, it's referring to something, but they're not exactly sure what. So uh, that made it just so completely perfect because it kind of built in this idea of like there's something weird going on. and I don't know what it is yet, but maybe if I keep reading, I'll find out. Well, we are definitely uh, going to put this on a staff pick. This book was great. This book was a lot of fun. It definitely hit all of the buttons that I like to read. And I know a lot of our listeners will feel the same. Uh, so thank you so much for, um, re for writing it. Yeah, thank you so much for all the kind words and for having me. Like the, the, this was such a blast. Thank you. So once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. Our guest was? Rob Hart. And as of this episode, uh, Paradox Hotel will be available in bookstores and uh, libraries, of course, everywhere, and maybe even bookstores in hotel lobbies where you can't go to the past. I certainly hope so. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day. We are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.